ISEC 100 students. We're back with chapter 15. And some people think that our psychology 100 class is all about chapter 15, psychological disorders. Now you can correct the record and tell them, you know what? It's not all about disorders. We talk about the ear and the eye and the brain and stress and a variety of different things before we get to this. But a lot of people assume that this is what this class is all about. You have to set them straight. There's more to it. Now, if you happen to like this chapter, then tell them to take Psych 250 besides Psych 100, because Chapter 15 is pretty much all of Psych 15 throughout the entire, or uh, Chapter 15 throughout the entire semester. I happen to feel that Chapter 15 and 16 are my favorites. So we save the uh, favorites best for the last, so to speak, for those students who are determined to finish this semester. And I'm glad you're still here. I wish everybody was. The question that often comes up is, what's normal and what's abnormal or abnormal? And of course, one easy way to question that or the answer to that question is to say, well, things that start to interfere with our ability to be in relationships, to work, to go to school, to function. That's when it's starting to cross into the abnormal range. So we're interested in psychopathology. When somebody suffers from a mental disorder that's pathological, that's more than just, well, I feel a little down these days because it's been cloudy. Ah, that's normal, right? So what are the criteria? Um, the criteria include things like when it goes against the normal cultural norms, right? A particular behavior. Uh, you go to the beach, but you have no clothing on. That's violating the cultural norms. Uh, is it maladaptive? Well, if you're running around naked, that's probably a maladaptive thing, right? Is it self-destructive? Eh, it gets kind of gray there. It depends on how you look. I guess some people might be upset by that. And of course, that could lead to the causing of discomfort to some people. But you can see how a lot of stuff is gray area. You see a person with a basket full of things on the side of the road, and they're mumbling to themselves. They meet some of the criteria. They go against the cultural norm. Are they self-destructive? Well, if it was our relative, a family member, we would think they would be self-destructive, but we don't have enough to do something about them. So I want to tell you about my case study. We have five case studies for this film club. And the first one is called Mrs. Talk-A-Lot. I have a photograph I just took this morning of my house on Beachdale Street. There's the house I grew up in from ages five to 18. And it's a two-story brick Tudor-style home. We used to have two pine trees in front of it. This picture was taken years after I moved out. And um, it was built in the 1920s. I don't know if you can tell by the picture or not, but our uh, we have bars on the windows and doors for security reasons, not for decorative purposes. When I was 14 going on 15, my brother, who was 18 going on 19, came to me and he said, you know what? I want you to take over my empire. Now, before you jump to conclusions, he wasn't referring to drugs. He was referring to his long cutting business, which he had six of our neighbors, all elderly women, widows, who he cut the lawn for from June through August. It wasn't generating much cash for him and being an older individual, he needed more cash. So he asked what I'd like to take over. I hesitated because I've never been a good landscaper. My brother, on the other hand, he would cut the lawn and rake it and sweep it and edge it. And it looked so pretty. It looked like Dodger Stadium, looked like the Big A, looked like Tiger Stadium. Me, on the other hand, well, you can just come to my house. You can clearly see that there's no grass in the front of the house or the back of the house. It's just pretty sad looking. But I took the job offer because I needed the cash. And 
One of the customers was Mrs. Talkalot. She lived a block away, same side of the street, right on Beachdale Street. Every two weeks, starting in June through July, I'd go to her house, go to the back door. Everybody who knew you uh, always went to the back door. Now, if you were a company or a special guest, you went through the front door. Everybody else went through the back door. Went and knocked it a couple times in the back door. Here comes this elderly, 80-something-year-old Caucasian female. She stood about four foot ten. She probably weighed only 90 pounds. Her hands were all bent and twisted from rheumatoid arthritis. She had gold-rimmed um, bifocal glasses, kind of bluish-gray eyes, very pale skin. She'd come down, and she looked through the back window. She said, may I help you? She had kind of a squeaky voice like that. And I said, well, I'm Jeff from down the street. I'm here to cut your lawn. And she said, oh, okay, just a minute. So she'd go and get the keys. Now, the keys were to the garage. She had a bunch of tools that her husband used to do, uh, cut the lawn before he passed away. And... Um, she said there was no reason for me to bring my own tools when she had all the same stuff. And I was kind of relieved because my push mower, you know, the kind of mower you push and the blades go around, uh, the blades were very dull. So I'd have to run about four or five feet just to cut a little bit of grass and continue that process over and over again. I think that's how I developed into becoming Spider-Man because of just the strenuous work all the time. So she opens the door, and before she hands me the keys, she would tell me the story of her life. Now, I'll be honest with you. I heard the story of her life multiple times, multiple times. But I was taught to respect my elders, so I pretended like it's the first time I heard it. And she told me about the early days of Detroit and what an exciting city it was. And it must have been because it nearly had about 2 million people in it at the time. Now there's uh, less than 900,000. She... Um, she talked about um, meeting her husband, who was an electrical engineer, and she was very proud of the fact that he taught her how to wire some of the outlets in the house, which she did. And she said women in her day never did stuff like that, but she did. When she got to the part where she talked about her husband passing away, I knew it was coming, but I could see the tears well up behind her bifocal glasses. And I always felt bad for her because she still missed him, even though it had been 15 years. So she catches up to the present. She hand me the keys. I would cut the lawn the best I could and rake it and sweep it and edge it, put away the tools, hand her back the keys, and she'd give me a couple dollars, maybe two fifty, if I did a good job. That was the going rate at the time. So we repeated the same process every two weeks. So two weeks came and went, and I went to her back window and I knocked on the door, and there was no answer twice, usually after the second time she came down, three times, four times, no answer. And I thought, that's weird. She always answered the door. So I came back the second day, same thing. I'm getting kind of concerned because by the third day, the grass is even getting longer, which means I have to run about maybe five or six feet to cut a little bit of grass. So I'm knocking and knocking. And all of a sudden, this man starts walking down the steps. I'm thinking, what the fuck? This man, let me describe him. He looks like he's in his 40s. He has long hair, kind of brownish gray that goes past his shoulders. He has a long brownish beard, brownish gray that goes to the middle of his stomach. He looks like he stands about five foot six. He looks very thin built, so I'm going to guess that he weighs maybe 120 pounds. When he's coming down the steps, I notice he's got this blue-green workman-type shirt on and blue-green workman-type pants. Uh, but they're way too big for him. Obviously, huge sizes. As a matter of fact, for his pants, he doesn't have a belt. He has a rope that's tied in a knot to keep his pants from falling down. As he's walking down the steps, uh, I notice that he's got a couple balls of rags around both of his feet. I can't tell if he's got any socks or shoes on, but they're just rags kind of covering both of his feet. So he opens the door, and with his kind of bluish eyes, he looks at me. He says, may I help you? And I swear to God, it sounds just like Mrs. Talkalot, but obviously it's not her. So I'm standing there in shock, and I'm like, um, 
I'm here to cut the lawn. And he says, just a minute. So he goes back up the steps. He leaves the door wide open, right? He goes back up the steps. And I'll never forget this because he turned right at me. He looked right at me with his long, scraggly finger. And he says, can you come inside for a minute? I want to show you something. And oh my gosh, I mean, picture the comic books with the spidey senses shooting out the top of my head. And I'm thinking, okay, first of all, who the fuck are you? What the fuck do you want to show me? And what the fuck happened to Mrs. Talk a lot, right? So I kind of checked him out. I thought I can take him. So I let him go first up the steps. Uh, I'm not going to let him go behind me. You know, I've seen those movies, right? And um, so we go into the house. It's the first time I've been into the house. We go into the kitchen. And this horrible smell comes to me. I'm talking about a spoiled milk factory. And sure enough, it was a bunch of melt cartons that had been thoroughly washed out stacked from floor to ceiling, butter containers, orange juice, all kinds of dairy products, cottage cheese containers. He wanted me to haul them out. And a lot of stuff smelled really bad and spoiled. And so he gave me a bunch of garbage bags and I load them all up and start hauling them out. And one time he got a little close to me and he says, I like drinking milk with a little twinge to it. And I thought, Ugh, I don't like drinking sour milk myself. So I haul that stuff out. And he goes to the back door and hands me the key. And I cut the lawn, just like I would do for Mrs. Talk a lot. And I gave him the keys back and he gave me a couple dollars. And I left there with more questions and answers. So two weeks came and went. And I go to the back of the house again, thinking to myself, okay, who's going to answer the door this time? Freddy Krueger? So I'm knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking. And there's no answer. So I go back the second day and I'm thinking, where is everybody, right? I'm knocking, knocking. By the third day, I'm getting really concerned because the grass is getting super long. I'm knocking, knocking. And finally, the neighbor sees me and says, nobody's there. I says, well, do you know where the lady is? Because I, I cut her lawn every two weeks. And the neighbor said a hearse came by and took away two bodies. And I thought, well, there goes my lawn cutting business, right? No. Question is, who was that man? Well, I figured it out. It wasn't her husband. He died 15 years ago. It was actually her son. Her son lived in that house his entire life. Now, Mrs. Takalot told me the story of her life every two weeks. And she failed to mention that she had a son. And he lived here the entire time. As a matter of fact, I remember one time she was telling me the story of her life and I saw the curtains move from the kitchen window. But I just thought it was the wind. No, it wasn't the wind. It was him. He was looking through the window. But why didn't she tell me about her son? I have a feeling because of this term right here. Now, hopefully you know what this term means. I think because of this term, stigma. I think that Mr. and Mrs. Talkalot had a son who was mentally ill. And back in the day, you had a couple of choices. You could take care of that son at home, or you could send that son off to an institution. And most kids who went off to institutions never came back. Matter of fact, some of our older mental hospitals, they have cemeteries on their locations because that's where the patients went. They never left the facility. I think they decided to take care of their son and they just didn't tell people about him because once you mention you have a son, people start asking questions. Well, does, does he go to school? Does he work? What does he do? You know, then you have to explain he's mentally ill and then people start making assumptions and what did you do to him? And, you know, of course, we didn't understand mental illness that much. We just would blame the parents, specifically the mother, right? Spending more time with a child. You must have done something. To Those poor people. So they took care of him the best they could. And then Mrs. Mr. Talkalot died and Mrs. Talkalot took care of him. And then she died and he did the best he could to continue what she normally did. So when I went into that kitchen to clean out all that trash, Mrs. Talkalot was there. So I wonder, here's my question for the day. How many of you have Mrs. Talkalots in your neighborhood? We'll continue with chapter 15 and more case studies next time.